Good morning and welcome to yet another Ogden Air Logistics Complex Commanders Town Hall. And we'd like to say a special welcome to all our geographically separated units. And we certainly apologize for um, any technical difficulties um, that we may have experienced. Um, but let's jump right into it. I'm Ron Brown and uh, I'd like to welcome our amazing team here. Uh, we'd like to welcome our Commander, Brigadier General Gibbs, our Vice Director, Ms. Hathaway, our Vice Commander, Colonel Christensen, and our Senior Enlisted Advisor, Chief Arbogast. And so, uh, let's talk about some of the things that we're gonna cover today. We are gonna look at a very brief intro. Well, I think we should do an extended, uh, or an intro, nonetheless, of Ms. Hathaway. And then we are gonna share a little bit about COVID-19 and religious exemptions. Then we are going to uh, turn the tables to our strategic plan and give you a little overview of what's happening strategically. Then we will talk about some of the, some of the things that's happening tactically throughout our complex, and then cover a couple of questions and answers that have been submitted by our directors and many of the people from our workforce. All right, so let's just get things going, we'll turn things over now to our esteemed leader, General Gibbs, sir, over to you. Great, thanks, Ron. Hey, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome. I uh, appreciate you attending another town hall uh, this morning. I'm excited to be able to uh, uh, introduce to you our new vice director for the complex, uh, Miss Michelle Hathaway. So uh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about who she is, uh, and so I'm going to start with those work experiences. And so uh, she started out here a number of years ago uh, as a GS3 staffing sp specialist. Uh, and, and in fact, she started over at the 1200 series. Uh, so has spent a lot of time in the ALC specifically uh, working at four of the six groups here at Hill Air Force Base. And then also, um, ALC headquarters, uh, headquarters, ALC staff. Uh, she has been both the uh, director of FM and business development. And then her last assignment was as a career broadening assignment, learning the supply chain uh, as the deputy director of the supply chain group here at Hill. Um, so what she focused on uh, as the vice director. Uh, obviously, we've got a number of uh, opportunities and challenges, uh, but where she's focusing in on is, is forecasting how we utilize pay and rewards. So uh, you'll hear that a couple of times as we go through today's presentation with you. Uh, automation and then planning and scheduling. On the personal side, she's been married for 26 years. They have five kids uh, who have given them five grandkids so far. Um, Best part. <laughs> she loves to uh, fish, camp, golf, and take cruises. Too. And so far, the, uh, the coolest fact that, uh, that I have heard, there's, there's probably other great stories, but the, the coolest one I've heard is when she was chased by a Kodiak bear uh, while in <laughs> Kodiak, Alaska. True story. So, <laughs> so maybe, maybe at some point she can share that story with us all. Um, <laughs> But I'll go ahead and turn it back over to you, Ron. Thanks, sir, so much. And again, welcome, Ms. Hathaway. All right, next topic, I think everyone's uh, favorite subject, COVID-19. And so um, we are going to um, uh, talk about masks, vaccinations, and waivers and all. But um, uh, we, we certainly would like to also say thanks to Colonel Pepper for um, providing so many inputs. He wasn't able to make it here today, but as our base public health uh, expert, he still uh, assisted us in, on answering a man, many of the questions that we, and I'm sure you have. All right, so um, I'll turn the first question over to General Gibbs, sir, if you wouldn't mind answering. And the question just simply says, so many are grateful to have the option of not wearing masks now. Yeah. <laughs> Do you see a point in the near future on base where we no longer track testing or no longer even wear masks again or no longer track COVID causes? Uh, great question. And I too am really grateful that we don't have to wear the masks right now. Um, <clears throat> but but I'll, I'll say to answer your question, it depends. Uh, so the reason we're not having to wear masks right now, the reason we're not having to do the, uh, the regular uh, testing, uh, that's all because of the lower transmissibility rates or lower transmission rates off installation. So uh, at the low and medium levels, we can step back from the posture that we have had for essentially the last two years. 
Uh, and so it really depends. So if the community levels increase again, uh, or if we've got a surge, uh, you may see a requirement to go back to masks. But uh, right now, we're doing very well in the local community. In fact, the numbers that I heard just this morning are, are really good, uh, and hopefully that trend continues. Uh, but you know, the other thing is this virus is changing, and it has changed uh, and mutated multiple times uh, over its life. Uh, and so if a new and significant variant emerges, then uh, mask mandating and testing uh, may be uh, a strong possibility. So I wouldn't say go out and uh, get rid of your masks. Um, you know, have them uh, at home ready to go, uh, but hopefully we don't have to go back to those again. Awesome. And, and it, it would be fair to, I mean, it's all our hope that everything has gone away, but, but, but there's still some evidence that there may be um, some more variants popping up. So maybe, uh, Chief, can you help us out with this? This was a question that was asked, and um, uh, I think um, uh, it's, a, it's a worthy question. Will the federal government require COVID-19 booster shots as pa part of, our, of the overarching vaccine requirement? Okay, Ron. Um, Studies have shown that uh, boosters help maintain protective immunity and reduce uh, mortality rates. As for uh, the mandate to actually get the booster shots, um, it's most likely that's gonna be coming from the DOD or level, high, or higher levels. Awesome, okay. And so that's, that's awesome. And um, of course, you know, the general workforce always has, have, will have these concerns about whether I should or I shouldn't. And so, uh, Colonel Christensen, maybe this is a good question for you, sir. Uh, any information on COVID waivers and when decisions or uh, re religious exemptions may be approved? Any timelines, anything that you can share on that? Yeah, that's a, I know that's a question that's out there for all of our civilian workforce. The bottom line is back in January, there was uh, an injunction issued against the president's executive order that requires all civilians and contractors to be vaccinated. Uh, an appellate court uh, de declined to stay that, which in maintainer terms, that means they uh, decided not to take any action. And that got pushed up to the Supreme Court. So because of that, the Air Force has halted all activity uh, with regards to waivers and exemptions. And uh, at this point, we are still on hold. We did hear from our uh, headquarters at AFSC that we hope to get some information here in the next week or two. Uh, but right now, the status is what it's been. Everything's on hold and we're awaiting more information from uh, the folks that uh, run our department and our Air Force. Awesome. So as always, flexibility is the key to air power, you know, one of Semper our favorite Gumby. adages, right? <laughs> um, and and um, uh, sp speaking of which, too, when we think of um, our, our, our unique sayings in the Air Force, you know, and, and, and just general philosophy, fail to plan, plan to fail. We're gonna turn things to our strategic portion, and sir, I'm gonna turn this question over to you here. Uh, of course, uh, we, um, we're, we're really hoping to have a better picture on what we're gonna be doing strategically in the complex. So um, do you see anything on the amazing OLC crystal ball, if you will, <laughs> for our strategy that you'd like to share with us? Crystal ball, I have not found that yet, but, uh, <laughs> but I will keep looking. Uh, so last time I, I spent a while talking about uh, the airframes that are coming in, the workload that we're gonna see. Uh, this time, I, I think I'll just talk a little bit to uh, what's coming in the, the closer term, still looking out a, a little ways, but um, so, so four, three or four, or three or four things to share with you. Um, you know, so the first is reference our training system, so, so TSS. We're working with AFMC A4 right now to, to improve uh, our ability to reflect within that system skill levels. Uh, so right now the system only focuses on uh, the throughput from the classes. So the number of students that, that actually go through and finish the class um, versus taking a look at, you know, kind of a, a three, five, seven skill level from, th from the, uh, the milita military side of the house where you're looking at apprenticeships, journeymen, uh, master craftsman level. Uh, and so it's really important for us as we're looking at the workload that's coming in uh, that we plan carefully uh, the different skill levels. And right now we don't have a good system to track. And so we're looking at building that into our, uh, our database, the TSS uh, system. Uh, and that's really gonna show uh, the health of the workforce and enable your leadership to better plan for, for the workload that's coming. 
Uh, so that's the first thing. Second thing would be expanding implementation of our depo training school uh, or depo technical school. Right now we do that with just sheet metal. Uh, and the intent would be to expand to electricians, composite fabricators, and LO technicians, uh, low observable technicians. So that courseware development uses all, all the, uh, the latest and greatest technologies. It's looking at instructors, SMEs, courseware developers, uh, and talking to your leadership. And the intent is right after new employee orientation uh, and before the folks are released to do a OJT, uh, they get a, a, a really in-depth immersion into uh, their particular uh, career field. Uh, and the intent really is to, is to bring you on board um, a lot faster. Uh, and then you're, you're primed and ready to go for that OJT training where you're actually out on the aircraft. You, you've got the components taken apart on your table and, and you're ready to start uh, doing the OJT. So, so I'm pretty excited about that. And it does make use of our uh, 357 skill levels that we were talking about, uh, but it's, it's gonna be designed to get you through that apprentice level much faster than in the past. Uh, another thing to share with you is about TAMS, or Temporary a Aircraft Maintenance Shelters, uh, or structures. Uh, the TAMS project is uh, well underway, and you're gonna hear that acronym every once in a while. Uh, what TAMS it really is, it's a temporary uh, hangar that we're putting out on the flight line. Uh, it's gonna facilitate swing space. Uh, as we do the construction in Hangar 225, Building 225, uh, you know, doing the seismic upgrades, that's a multi-year project and it's basically having us move aircraft around and we are gonna lose a bit of space. And so having the TAMS uh, shelter out there, uh, that's gonna allow for 28 F-16 size dock spaces uh, and so really expand our capacity out and allow us to keep operating out of both facilities, allow the workload to continue unabated. Um, so we are uh, at the groundbreaking point for TAMS uh, and Occupancy ready will be November of 23. So I think that would be really exciting to see that uh, that structure actually going up. Um, fourth thing I wanted to share with you, I will actually defer based on time, and it's talking about the road to green. Uh, and so this is an initiative that uh, uh, is underway. Uh, so I'll defer to Colonel Christensen. Uh, he is the expert in this because uh, he's been spending a lot of time focused here with the team. Uh, and so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll save time there and give that over to him. So back to you, Ron. Well, in fact, uh, you know, when I heard that, and thank you, sir, and whew, sounds like we have a lot of work ahead of us. So that's uh, pretty exciting. And I don't know if you have heard of the road to green. I, I did, and, and I tried to pass the trivia test and I failed. I thought it was something about us becoming Army again, and, and that was <laughs> not it. And so um, Colonel Christensen will clarify this for us. So sir, tell us, yes, this road to green, what is it? Sure, uh, it, 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 we're not, turning back into the Army or going that way. Uh, Road to Green is a complex wide initiative um, where the, the folks up in the front office, all of us at this table, um, are trying to break down external constraints that the squadrons and the groups deal with every single day. We're gonna better engage our enterprise partners in DLA, supply chain, in the SPOs, uh, to frankly make it easier for everybody to do their job unimpeded. Uh, Removing constraints and allowing you to be as uh, efficient and effective as possible is what the basis of Road to Green is. We have three primary lines of effort, and uh, we'll get into one of those a little bit uh, deeper uh, later. But IT, IT is frustrating. IT is uh, what we all depend on, and uh, IT is a constraint that uh, we're gonna try and improve for you out there. We have a focus on hiring and training, so not only getting our workforce up to the levels we need for the productivity, but as the general alluded to, uh, we have a training focus to make sure that uh, everybody out there that's doing the job has all the training that we owe them uh, when they get out there and actually work on the airplanes, components, missiles, software, you name it. And then finally, we are creating a better constraint resolution and elevation process and weaving that into our highest level production meetings. So things that don't work right out on the floor are accelerated up to General Gibbs and Miss Hathaway and even myself so we can uh, resolve those constraints quicker and get you back to work, reduce the frustrations you have out there. Um, 
finally, we're developing a complex priority system because we have shared resources across our complex that we all use. Uh, NDI, organic manufacturer, paint and blast, and uh, making uh, a priority system that makes it very clear where we can best use those resources. So that's Road to Green in a nutshell. Uh, getting us back to uh, green performance, uh, making sure we're financially solvent, and making sure that the folks out there that do the hard work, uh, the actual work, uh, not like what we do up here, <laughs> uh, are, are best equipped to do that. I think you'll work a little hard, and and and, <laughs> and it, but it really sounds a lot like AOP, you know, out of the possible in the very very core concept of you know it is um, AOP cost, based, you know, Absolutely. safety efficiency, uh, yep. uh, cost, speed, safety, and and um, um, or speed, safety, quality, and cost efficiency. So it is the it, foundation of Road to Green. 100%. Very very cool, very very cool. All right, awesome. You know, and speaking of AOP, uh, we, we're still in that strategic realm, and so uh, General Ribs, we're gonna. Um, turn this uh, back over to you, and and I, I think um, uh, we have heard so much about the strategic plan. Well, you know, truth be told, you know, I helped uh, for the first time really get behind the entire strategic plan. Whew, it was it was pretty awesome to to see that um, that whole uh, puzzle being put together. But if you wouldn't mind taking those puzzles uh, pieces apart and sharing a little bit your perspective on on our strategy, our overall overall strategy for our complex. Uh, absolutely, thanks Ron. Uh, so I don't know that everybody needs to take that document out, read that, um, you know, have that on your table, uh, but I will say there's value in it, especially for your leadership and, and kind of taking that whole organization uh, and, and driving us in one single direction versus a dozen different directions. Uh, so it's really useful in that sense. Uh, so absolutely, I would encourage leaders, uh, even, even down uh, to our lowest level supervisors, uh, I think it's worth perusing uh, and spending just a couple of minutes taking a look at that. Um, I think that strategic plan, uh, the, the real keys, the real takeaways for you are going to be in the goals. And, and Colonel Christensen mentioned the goals just a little bit. Uh, so. We start out by, in the document, talking about the mission and what it is that we do here, and that's really about sustaining military readiness through regularly maintained aircraft and equipment to support the warfighter. That's the bottom line. Um, now, each of us do our jobs, uh, and, and we focus on speed, safety, quality, cost, uh, and then my vision is an empowered team, meaning you have ability to make decisions, uh, and move out on things, and as much as we can empower you, uh, we're working to do that. Uh, it's an empowered team working as partners in innovation, delivering resiliency, uh, resilient, persistent, and agile sustainment. Uh, and so to those goals, how we're gonna get after that, uh, four primary ones, and you'll see that on a slide in front of you. Uh, you know, the first one, process. Uh, this is a huge operation. And so we need to be good at processes to be effective and to do our job without waste. Uh, the second one, <clears throat> mission execution. We absolutely need to stay focused on readiness, <clears throat> excuse me, readiness of our warfighter uh, producing on time and on budget. And again, those are road to green uh, discussions. Using art of the possible, absolutely. Uh, the third one, resources. There's never enough resources. Um, so we have to plan really, really well. Money, parts, and most importantly, well-trained people to do that job. Uh, and then people, uh, that is number four there. Uh, and that is not the lowest priority, uh, but that is wrapping everything together. That is our most important part is the people. Recruiting, developing, retaining, uh, uh, that entire workforce is critical, uh, and we need to get that right. And so our plan addresses how we're going to get after those. Uh, we have representatives from each of the different areas, uh, each of the different units that are, uh, are absolutely integral to the process. Uh, for the working groups, we have a regular uh, battle rhythm that, that we're after. And they've made a lot of progress getting after those challenges. Uh, and so the solutions that you're going to see coming out are not necessarily perfect. Uh, if I waited for perfection and to get to that 100% solution, we would rarely step out with initiatives. So we're going to get to an 80% solution or better, 
and we're going to move out and then we're going to fix the things that aren't perfect and so looking for feedback from yourself uh, from your, your team leadership up channel those get those into the teams uh, and we're going to keep working to improve things Awesome, and it's and it's really refreshing this year too. This this season, this go round of of having our strategy not just look on the first one or two years, but a five year and maybe even five years and beyond. And um, I think that that Absolutely. really is is uh, setting us all up for not just success but a good sustainment posture. And and that's pretty awesome. All right, okay, so that's all the strategy stuff here. Okay. So let's let's kind of uh, take a step down a little bit past the operational into the tactical realm. And Ms. Hathaway, we've got to bring you back in here and, and <laughs> talk about some uh, tactical stuff. And we're going to hit safety here in a minute, so just, just be ready for that, but we'll hold everything. I need to know about the bear. I, I don't know. I, it's just, you know, I got stuck on the Kodiak. Who gets chased by a bear? And so this actually happened. This actually this happened. Is just, we're not it's, making this no, up. I, no, I have pictures. Um, so I guess for a lot of folks who don't know, um, Missile Maintenance Group actually um, helps do some maintenance on a site that's actually out on Kodiak Island. We actually shoot missiles from that site. So it was a TDY trip I had gone on, decided, you know, maybe I'll take a few extra days because as you know, the general mentioned, I, I do love to fish. Uh, went out fishing and was out in the middle of the river and here comes a bear charging at me. <laughs> I, I heard a, my friend with me and my buddy from MMXG also saying, buh, buh, bear. <laughs> and I looked up and I took off running and uh, went fa face first into the river. Um, so the old adage, you don't have to be the fastest, just don't be the slowest. <laughs> I was the slowest, uh, but yeah, it actually happened. So it's, you know, kind of oh. interesting. We're going to mix that with safety, not necessarily bear safety, but safety. <laughs> well, you made it, so you're my hero. Okay. Again, again, you know. Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> safety. Safety. You know, so safety is one of those things that I think we have to remember, it's not just about being safe at work, it's about being safe at home as well. Um, we have noticed here just in the last, you know, six months, even to the year, that we've had a slight uptick in where we would see slips, trips, and falls. Um, also, strains and sprains. Um, and, you know, for those of us who have lived in Utah a really long time, we know that we generally see those slips, trips, and falls happen a little bit more, specifically the slips uh, in wintry conditions. Uh, so, you know, so just some general awareness. I know a lot of the buildings actually have salt outside. Uh, VPP, our Voluntary Protection Program for Safety, they do a really good job of providing that type of stuff where you can go out and perhaps, you know, if you see that it's icy, you know, make sure you go out and salt it if you can, save somebody else from falling. Um, trips and falls, uh, the majority of that usually happens in our maintenance areas, uh, specifically with our maintenance stands. Um, and we do use a lot of hoses and cords. And so, you know, just being, you know, generally aware out in the workplace, hey, I've just got to be careful going down those stands and, you know, and try and watch for those things that are laying out and make sure you don't trip. Um, strains and sprains um, usually are happening in our lifting. Um, so just, again, use proper lifting techniques. We do have, uh, you know, sometimes you might need to employ the phone a friend and have somebody come out and help you do that. So absolutely make sure if you've got something large or that's awkward that somebody goes out and helps you. Um, that's mostly in the workplace. Uh, one other issue I forgot to bring up is we do also work with a lot of um, fluids in the workplace um, where we have folks who slip, you know, hydraulic fluid. Uh, we really need to place some emphasis on housekeeping. Uh, make sure that we're going out. Sometimes we may go up, we, we wipe it up with a towel, but it doesn't get all of it. Somebody slips and trips um, on something, whether it be a cord or hydraulic fluid, just be careful out there. Uh, the last thing I want to cover is motorcycle safety. So it's getting warm out there, and uh, there's a lot of us are wanting to get out there on our Harleys or whatever motorcycle you ride, and also on bicycles. So this, again, is just one of those things where we all need to be observant and share the road. Uh, be watching, because you know those guys are all going to be out there in force, guys and gals out there on their bikes doing their thing. So be careful, watch for those uh, people. And then uh, next, I would say there are safety courses available uh, for the riders. Go out and take those, and please make sure that you're wearing proper gear. So I guess just to wrap up, you know, just remember we all want you to get home um, safe and sound to your friends and family, um, and you know, just be diligent at home and at work when it comes to safety. Thanks, ma'am. And and yes, let's. Take, let's, let's be good wingmen, take care of each other. Another big issue that's, that's coming up, and Chief, I'm gonna turn this one over to you, so get ready, brace yourself, here it comes. 
Um, another issue is uh, cat cards and, and the whole process of getting our cat cards updated and renewed and all that. Uh, do you have any latest and greatest on cat card challenges, timelines, um, how we can redeem some time with, with cat cards, any, anything that you can share with, with our audience? Yeah. Um, first of all, the FSS uh, section is actually working through a, a few issues and they have a lot of challenges that they have to overcome when it comes to issuing cat cards. Um, first of all is all their CAC equipment um, to actually issue a new card is issued by the Data Manpower Defense Center. Um, so it's not here locally, it's actually a DOD type program. And whenever they log on to the system, they actually have to log in through a VPN. It's not a local server or anything like that. So anytime any server or computer issues happen, it slows down uh, the amount of cards and stuff that they can issue during a day. Um, also, when they have the, the equipment, if there's issues with the individual pieces of equipment, they can't just go out and buy another piece of equipment. They have to actually swap it um, through the Data Manpower Defense Center. So they might have a, a station that is down for a couple days because they have to take a, let's say, a, a thumb card reader, ship it off, and actually get another one back before they can bring the station back up. Um, typically here on base at this FSS, they normally have four stations up and operating most of the time, so they do have a, quite a, a bit of availability to actually schedule appointments. Um, you should be seeing a, a slide in front of you that on the bottom of that slide should have a, a link. That is the link that you need to use to actually go ahead and schedule an appointment. When you click on there, you, it has a couple drop down menus for asking what your location is. And if you're out here in, in Utah, when you click on that, you'll actually get two options to either get one here on base or at the, the guard unit. You can click, click either which one and, and actually decide where you want to actually get your, your card done. Um, the main part about that is you need to schedule early. Uh, their appointments are up to 90 days in advance. Um, last week I, I was on there, April was already all filled up. Uh, they only had the appointments for, for the end of May. And actually, uh, since it's the end of the month, June should have just opened up. So now would be a good time if you need a new cat card to get on there because there should be a lot more availability for getting an appointment. Um, when it comes to Last minute things, we all know sometimes we don't know exactly when our CAT cards are gonna be due, but hopefully you guys look at your cards, you know when they're coming due, but if you need a CAT card, they do offer 20 appointments every day um, for walk-in on basically Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Thursdays are, are set aside, they still do issue CAT cards, but they're set aside for our new hire program, um, the AFSC initiative to get the people onboarded quickly. That's set aside for Thursdays. So you can go on and you can get a, a card, and we recommend that you get on there as early as possible. Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is, is appointments, as well as Fridays, but Thursdays are set aside for the new hires. Um, when it comes to uh, going and actually getting your, your CAT card, there's sometimes that you don't actually need to go into the to the actual FSS to, to get it fixed. If you're just locked out or need a pin reset, there's CAC pin resets machines in buildings 843, 847, and 1209, so you might be able to get it done locally at, at your, your own building. And also, if you get your account, if you, for some reason you have to get locked out of your account, you can call your information assurance officer, and they can set you in the right direction, or call COM, which is here on, on base here, not outside the GSUs, the number is uh, 586-TECH, and they can help hook you up so that way you can get back, uh, back in business quickly. Um, but the ba main thing is to plan ahead and make sure when you come in for your appointment, you bring two forms of ID, one with uh, at least a, a photo ID, and the other one doesn't need to have a photo, but they both must be actually current. You can't have an expired ID trying to get another ID with it. So, so that's about it. Awesome, in other words, don't procrastinate, is what I've been uh, hearing, <laughs> and, I, and I know the folks are doing an incredible job. And speaking of people doing an incredible job, so many of you um, in, the, in, our, in our team, in our OLC family, have been doing such an amazing, amazing job, and we have the opportunity to recognize several. And so, General Gibbs, I, as I came into the foyer, as I see all these wonderful people getting awards, would you like to highlight some of those? and? to yeah, share of all the goodness that's going on. So first I, I wanna say the Air Force actually has a really good uh, awards program. Uh, and so from the time I was a second lieutenant till now, I often hear folks talk about it's not a great system, it's not a great program, there's not enough awards, there are a lot. And so I just wanted to hit before we jump into the slides, um, 7,843 performance awards 882 notable achievement awards for a total of $12.5 million, uh, and that's just in the past year here at Ogden uh, ALC. We've also got 105 named uh, distinguished awards, 12 uh, LAMP awards, Logistics Airman Mastering Possibilities, 
40 quarterly awards, uh, 10 uh, different categories, uh, 18 nominations for our AFSC or AFMC commanders uh, to make either personal calls or notes to, to our folks, peer-to-peer -peer recognition, uh, and time off awards, which are effectively unlimited. Uh, and so we have a lot of awards, uh, a lot of ways to recognize stellar performance. So, uh, so keep pushing folks into those uh, supervisors. I applaud your efforts. Uh, so jumping into the slides I wanted to share with you, uh, right off the bat, Leo Marquez Award winners. Uh, so these are the nominees from the Ogden ALC. And then the next slide we've got is the AFSC level folks. Uh, so congratulations to them. Uh, the next one is the Annual Excellence Awards. And so uh, we've got our Ogden ALC nominees. Uh, so congratulations and good luck to each of you. Uh, the Maintenance Professional of the Year Awards. Um, that is also for the Ogden ALC uh, nominees. So you'll see those folks. And then we have a winner uh, at the AFMC level. I don't know if that's uh, spelled out on the slide. I can't see that right now, but that is Major Matthew Hall. So congratulations for the win at AFMC. And then finally, the Depot Maintenance Members of the Year. Uh, again, these are the Ogden ALC nominees. Uh, congratulations to each of you. And we have two that have so far won at the AFSC level. Uh, and that's Mr. Darren Mitchell and uh, the other is a team award for the Expeditionary Depot Maintenance Flight, so EDMX, great job. And so again, thanks to, uh, for all of those folks for the hard work, setting the bar, um, and being great examples uh, for the supervisors that have, have submitted. Thank you, thank you, thank you, uh, and keep submitting. Awesome. Thank you, thank you so much, sir. And, um, uh, just for sake of time, what we're going to do is we're going to jump into uh, our questions that were asked um, from our command from our commanders as well as uh, directors. And um, so this this particular portion, uh, we are going to just focus on so many some of these questions that uh, many have posed. And, and the first one, uh, Ms. Hathaway, we'll, we'll pose to you. Uh, many of uh, we've heard your questions in the OLC concerning. OPM locality pay assessment. So there's a concern about OPM locality pay. Would you like to address that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I know this has been a very hot topic because we have a lot of folks, you know, we see the housing going up uh, in cost and so we're kind of asking those questions about, you know, are we going to see some form of locality increase here in the local area? So we did have a little bit of movement on this this week. Um, we had actually presented, and when I say we, I mean the 75th Air Base Wing, all of the leadership really on the base had presented to the Federal Salary Council in 2020 a request to actually increase locality. Um, at that time, um, it was presented to the council chairperson and it was actually declined. Um, we were told to go back, take a look at how we start using incentives and retention bonuses that are available to us. And so we have done that. We've done that through our STEM area. We're looking at how we may be able to apply that into our um, other areas, such as, you know, our federal wage service. Um, but now, um, after we had given that last, I guess, uh, presentation, the chairman resigned five days after that happened. Wow. So they had been waiting for a new chairman to be appointed to this Federal Salary Council, and he, uh, the person was actually appointed just day before yesterday. Uh, so we have not actually been able to go back to the Federal Salary Council again to, yes, present our case. And so that is actually, now that we have a council person in place, we will be able to uh, take that to the chair. So that will be on the schedule. Um, and then the next piece of this is that we really um, have gotten a lot of support from our local delegates here. Um, so I would say that, you know, you have a local congressman, you have, a, you know, local senators. Please do not, you know, feel like you can't go to those folks because they are actually on our side and they are also helping to try and push some of this forward with our, um, you know, with this salary rate increase. So hopefully we'll see some good movement soon and we'll keep you apprised of everything that happens in the future with this. Awesome, awesome. More money, more money, right? right. More money, more money. Uh, there, there's another question here for you and I'm just going to read the question as it's okay. written and so supervisors are concerned about uh, the impact or Im the impact the central hiring office is having on our ability to hire new college graduates. We have requested a total of eight graduates and have not received any. 
Uh, we're told even graduates who specifically request to join our team will not definitely get assigned to our team. So that was a question, and I think around the central hiring, so can you elaborate? Absolutely, again, um, so central hiring is something that is fairly new. Um, but really, it was an effort to um, get at some of the, I think, things that we were seeing in terms of, I guess, favoritism and nepotism. And so what the biggest change that happened with central hiring is that now the selecting official, so basically the supervisor that's hiring that person, is no longer on the panel that actually goes out and does that. Um, and it's a very targeted area. These are for only folks that are really coming in brand new to the organization from outside. And we're really trying to you know, get that program nailed down. So in an effort to do that, I think the majority of our students are really in our uh, software area. And so we have put together some new, I guess, directions and really to alleviate some of that miscommunication so that we can get folks um, to uh, provide information to the SMEs that are going to these hiring events um, so that they can now say, hey, which area do you want to go to? Which skills are you looking for? And we will be working hand in hand with the SWEG group to make sure that we are now have that stern communication so that we can really get the right folks in the right place. So hopefully you should see some of that alleviated. Awesome. So, so sometimes it may be a little slow, but sometimes slow is fast and fast is slow. Correct. And anytime right. we implement new programs, it, it's a little rocky, but I think we are, you know, we have it pretty well under control now. Awesome. All right. And moving on to question three, and we, we're, we're running out of time, so we are, we're going to, so yes, sir? Okay. The cameras actually turn off right at, uh, at w w in one minute. <laughs> okay. And so, sir, um, I'll, I'll just turn it over to you, to you for any comments that you might have, and then we will uh, wrap things up for today. Okay. Well, apologize for not getting to, uh, to all of our questions today. Uh, definitely appreciate folks taking the time to attend. I wanted to share quickly three things with you. Uh, one is we have lost teammates uh, through COVID. Uh, and so teammates, family members, uh, the chapel is hosting a sunset memorial service on the 1st of June at sunset uh, at the pond ne near TLF to remember those that we have lost uh, and to basically gather as a community. Uh, so we'll be sending emails and more details out as we get closer to that. DIOC survey, thanks to all those who participated. Uh, thanks especially to those who wrote uh, comments in for us. Your group leadership are looking at that now. And I am uh, right around the corner to take a look and we'll share that with you at the next one in, uh, in the summer uh, town hall. Uh, and so I'll just end right there and thank you for your time, uh, your attention, and I definitely appreciate all the work that you do out here. <laughs>